Good morning. Um, I guess since we last met, I'm going to give you two different things. One is um, since we last met, we were focusing really heavily on contact, the last thing in terms of research, and I've been going through and working out all of the various literature on what's going on in content. Many of you will be interested to know that there's actually not a lot of new research happening in this space at all. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the research out there is dated 2003 and before. Um, the exception um, are sort of the cast of characters that you got to see the last time. And so Michelle has kindly come back. Um, she has the most recent data in this space, which is why she's come back to sort of give you a perspective of it and give you some fleshed out understanding of how it relates to broader data sets that we know both in the US and the UK. Um, in terms of the research advisory board, there's a couple of different things that's going to happen. I'm going to get you all by the next time we meet in September, um, a crib of a literature review of this entire space. So if there are questions that are coming up or things that you're sort of going, well, is there anything on X, Y, Z? The sooner you can get that to me, the better. Um, this literature review will be, help you with as we go through and see some of the presentations um, in the public and private meetings in the fall um, to get some context of what kinds of problems they're actually addressing and what we know about that problem space. But hopefully that will flesh things out. Um, so one of, what we're going to do today is really focus on heavily on content. And we're going to sort of play a nice little team game. Um, Michelle's going to present a lot of the different information on uh, content access issues. Most notably, of course, is porn, but there's also questions of violent content access. Um, I'm going to then switch focus and talk more about what happens when we're talking about youth-generated production of problematic content. Um, and the thing to know is that there's not a lot of quantitative uh, data in this space yet. Um, so at the, I'm going to basically give some topology and give you a sense of what actually is going on. But I would first sort of introduce Michelle. I think many of you got to meet Michelle um, the last time. She's with the Internet Solutions for Kids. Um, she does a lot of research in this space, um, primarily doing quantitative survey research um, and some of the best and most important research out there. It would help a ton just for the people who are not here if it is possible for you to speak into the mic. Is it possible for one of us to be your tabber, uh, to press along? I'm sorry, it's inelegant, but I think it, for logistical reasons. Okay. Thanks everyone for having me back. It's, it's great to see um, everyone again. And um, as Dana said, I'll be focusing much more on sort of um, content exposure. Dana will be talking about content creation. Um, and so we'll be talking a lot about um, our data and then also acknowledging that our data is really building on, at this point, kind of 10 years worth of research, really looking at um, especially pornography exposure um, and a little bit also about violent websites. Certainly the folks at the University of New Hampshire uh, have always been on the forefront of this and then folks at, uh, in the UK. So just to give you a roadmap for where we're going, what we're going to be talking about today. First, we'll talk about exposure to X-rated material, um, looking at unwanted as well as wanted, because there is a difference, and I think it's important to talk about that. We'll also look at online versus offline. Um, I think it really helps to give us a context. You know, X percent of kids are looking at it online. Well, compared to what? Um, and then we'll talk about exposure to violence online. We don't talk a lot about this yet, but it's important to um, recognize and understand that there are different types of websites that are out there, um, and the question is how many kids are actually accessing them, okay? So just to remind you about the methodology for the Growing Up With Media survey, we talked to 1,588 kids in 2006, and then we followed up with them in 2007. So these data are from October and December of last year. We're talking about six-month-old data at this point. We did have a 76% follow-up rate, which means that about 1,200 of our kids came back and gave us more information. Young people were between the ages of 10 and 15 when we first talked to them, then uh, 11 and 16 at the most recent data collection point. We are funded by the Centers for Disease Control. The Youth Internet Safety Surveys, as you know, one was conducted in 1999-2000. The second one was conducted in 2005. Both included 1,500 young people. They were replication surveys. They were not a longitudinal survey of the same young people. But they did, in many ways, ask exactly the same questions so that they could really get at trends, what was going on, what had changed, what had stayed the same. 
The diff main difference between this survey and the Growing Up With Media survey, this is a telephone survey, and the young people were 10 to 17 years of age, ours were 10 to 15. That's important because we're seeing a lot of these things kind of increase as age increases. So we would expect to see a lot of the frequencies that we talk about today to be slightly higher in the Youth Internet Safety Survey. All right. So let's talk about unintentional ex uh, exposure to X-rated material. I think this is really the space that we end up talking quite a bit about because um, researchers and adolescent health professionals are very concerned about kind of what does it mean when a young person not intentionally is exposed to X-rated uh, material on the internet. So as I mentioned, the uh, folks at the University of New Hampshire, the Youth Internet Safety Surveys have really kind of been the ones that have been looking at this in the United States, they define it as one of two things in the last 12 months. Have you been on a website that showed pictures of naked people or of people having sex when you did not want to be on such a site? So we're talking about naked people, we're talking about people having sex when you didn't want to be there, okay? The second possibility is whether or not you opened an email or an instant message with advertisements or links to an X-rated website. So the second one's a little bit different, one, because it's being pushed to you, but also two, because we're talking about links, not necessarily pictures. So what do they find? Well, in 2005, among the 1,500 kids that they talked to, about 34% reported an unwanted exposure. So about one in three young people said, yes, I've been exposed to X-rated material at least once. I've, I've been exposed to sexual pictures at least once in the last year when I didn't want to. I'd like to point out that when we compare unwanted and wanted, we're talking about 40% of young people in that sample. So there's obviously quite a bit of overlap. Okay. Oops, sorry, go back. Okay, so about half of the kids are boys. This is for unintentional exposure. Half are boys. Three quarters of them are older, 14 to 17 years of age, okay? So you've got a, an age group of 10 to 17. You split it in half, 10 to 13, 14 to 17. Three quarters of them are in this older age group, okay? So it's very age defined. Where did it happen? Well, about uh, four in five said it happened while they were surfing on the web, and then one in five said it happened with an email or an IM that I didn't anticipate. Among those that said it happened when it, while they were surfing, 40% um, happened when they were doing online searches. So you're searching for something and you know, other sorts of uh, web pages pop up. Clicking on links within websites and then 12% misspelling addresses, website addresses. Okay, so Livingstone and Bover, so, sorry, yes, absolutely. Was that, Danny, um, can you please press your button? Oh, and again, actually you should tell us Hi, uh, Danny Weitzner, uh, MIT. Uh, was that a, was there a measure of how many such exposures there were or over what period of time any exposure happened? Yeah, so, so it's ever in the last 12 months. So ever, never. Uh, in, in the UK, Livingstone and Bober really are the ones that have the national data in the UK. They published their data in 2005. They're reporting slightly higher rates. Remember, we had 40% uh, that we were seeing in 2005 among our kids. They're saying 57% uh, had intentional or unintentional exposure. Similar to what we were seeing in the United States, they're seeing that the majority of exposure is unwanted, right? And um, age increases, so they're also seeing age effects. Among those who are nine to 11 years of age, one in five are exposed. Between those who are 12 to 15, that jumps up to four in uh, four and five, and then it jumps up to three and four young people at 16 to 17. A lot of unintentional exposures happening the same in the UK, which is good. It, good just because it kind of helps us see that the trends that we're seeing are not kind of wacky data, but we're really beginning to see some trends across uh, studies as well as across nations. So about 40% say the unintentional exposure happened from a pop-up. 36% said they accidentally found themselves on a website. Certainly that could include um, mistyping a website. That could include doing a search and finding yourself where you didn't mean to be. And then 25% received <coughs> junk mail. Okay. So uh, as many of you know, the Youth Internet Safety Survey uh, participants were asked a follow-up question about whether or not they knew it was X-rated when they clicked on the link. And we had a, the UNH folks had a pretty significant number. 21% said, well, yeah, I knew. And so there's been this whole discussion about what does it mean to be unwanted if you knew that the website was X-rated? Well, we don't really know is the, the quick answer. But some hypotheses are, you know, 
maybe they didn't really understand what it meant to be X-rated. Sometimes we have this assumption that young people know a lot more than they really do, and maybe they've heard the word X-rated but didn't really have a good sense of what it meant until they actually got to the website and they thought, oh, wow, okay, not what I was expecting. Another possibility um, is that perhaps they really were seeking out uh, sexual pictures, but they weren't seeking out these sexual pictures, okay? <laughs> So again, we don't really know, but, but in both cases, um, they could have intentionally clicked on the link and it would still be an unwanted sort of exposure. It's important also, also to point out, as we noted earlier, that there is a significant overlap between unwanted and wanted. Kids who say that they have um, had at least one unwanted exposure in the last year are almost three times as likely to also report that they had a wanted exposure in the last year. So we've got a lot of overlap there. But in terms of unwanted exposures, there's some concern about, um, in terms of sexual development, there's a lot going on in adolescence. For those who have unintentional exposures, does something happen? Do we kind of create curiosity? Are we kind of, you know, then creating intentional exposure? Well, at least based on the Youth Internet Safety Surveys, it doesn't appear so. Only 2% report going back to the website as a result of the unintentional exposure. Okay. So just as a quick synopsis, uh, more unwanted than wanted, more older youth than younger youth. Uh, when we talk about web searches versus email IM, we've got a four to one ratio there. Web searching is much more common for the uh, way people are being exposed in an unwanted fashion. And um, that's, okay. All right, so just quick stop, pit stop, any questions, comments, reactions? Okay. One thing I just, I wanna point out is that, you know, we're covering some stuff that's outside of the necessary, the scope of the task force at this point because most of the research at this point is on email and spam and, um, and random websites and search. We don't see a lot of it so far in terms of data, in terms of what we know uh, within the sites that are specific to the, the task force. Yep. Okay, let's talk about intentional exposure. So we just talked about unintentional exposure, exposure, all these pictures coming when young people didn't expect it. But what about young people intentionally seeking out some of these exposures? How often does it happen and what do these look like? So uh, we defined it in three ways. We tried to make it as parallel as possible so that we really could get some useful data about online as well as offline exposure. We asked young people whether or not they'd gone to or seen an X-rated or adult website where the main topic was sex online, whether or not they'd watched an X-rated movie, or whether or not they've looked at an X-rated magazine. In all three cases, the definition is X-rated where you knew the topic was going to be sex. So in 2006, remember this is a longitudinal survey, so 2006, 2007, we're beginning to see um, a little bit of trend. We're also beginning to see a little bit of the age effects, right? Because as young people get older, we expect to um, have them opt in a little bit more. Oh, lighter blue is internet, yellow is movies, darker blue is magazines. What we see is that the internet is not often the most common place that young people are seeking out pornography, at least X-rated material, they're not. Um, and what's interesting also is we've got a spike in 2007 with movies. I don't really know what that's about. But the most important thing here is I want to dispel the myth that the internet is really this huge access point for kids and X-rated material. It doesn't seem to be consistent with our data. Hi. It's Hamer from MySpace. Uh, how much do you think kids are distinguishing internet from an online video they see on YouTube or MySpace or any website that shows videos? versus the internet, quote unquote. So qualitatively, what I'm seeing is that we're only starting to see the idea of movies online as being a constitute of movies. Qualitatively, that's only been happening recently. I think one of the things that's missed in a lot of this picture is that most of the country, and particularly kids, are far behind in what's going on. So they're seeing YouTube, but they think of it as YouTube. They're not yet seeing movies online. They're only really starting to do that, so that that blending is starting to happen. It'll be interesting to see if we see a spike in internet when we field again this summer, that might be part of what we're seeing. Yeah. Okay, so the question is this wacky data. Maybe it's just the growing up with media survey. No. The Youth Internet Safety Surveys also saw similar stuff. Um, in 2000, 8% reported looking at X-rated material online. They also asked about offline stuff, and so 8%, 7%, 8%. Again, the percentages are very similar across. So it doesn't look like the internet really is um, a specific and increased access point for kids. 
In 2005, they didn't ask about offline, but they did ask about online exposure. It's 13%, which is well within what we're seeing with growing up with media. Okay. This is similar to the graphs that we looked at last time. So what this allows us to do is kind of look at, you know, now that we've basically got four different data sets, what's going on? Can we see trends? Are we beginning to see replication? That's what we want. We want to start seeing replication so that we have confidence that what we're seeing is, is true. So you've got the Youth Internet Safety Survey 1 and 2, and then the Growing Up With Media Survey. Remember, Growing Up With Media, same kids. Youth Internet Safety Survey, different kids. But what we're seeing is pretty nice trend line at this point, right? I mean, not a whole lot going on at age 10, spiking at 15, 16, 17. Across all four data sets, you're beginning to see a pattern. So based upon the wave two, so the, the data that we just finished collecting in December, our 11 to 16 year olds, we're seeing 80% male, which is what you probably would expect. The majority of young kids, of young people who are seeking out pornography are uh, male and older. Among our 11 to 16 year olds, average age is 14.4, okay? How did they hear about the website? Well, most of them found out from a friend. They also use search engines, another website, um, one of them that I like a lot, they typed in the website just to see what would happen, and then pop-up ads. Um, I want to talk about the psychosocial profile. This may look very similar to, for those of you who listen to our other talk. These kids have a lot going on in their lives, and the way to read this graph, the OR means odds ratio. What are the odds, given, those, given that a young person has said, yes, I intentionally looked for X-rated material in the last year, compared to those who said, no, I didn't. Okay. Those who said, yes, I've looked at x-rated material on the internet are almost three times as likely to be also physically bullying. They're two times as likely to be getting into fights. They're almost three times as likely to have poor academic performance. They're six, almost seven times as likely to be carrying a weapon to school in the last 30 days. Poor relationships with their caregiver. They're significantly more likely to be using substances and also engaging in seriously violent behavior. And when I say seriously violent, I mean seriously violent, like stabbing, shooting. Um, <laughs> getting into group fights. So these kids have a lot going on. And this is all cross-sectional data. We haven't looked at it longitudinally yet. So I'm not saying that pornography is causing these, and I don't think many of us would really believe it. And I don't think these things are causing X-rated material seeking. So what does that mean? It probably means that there's a lot of concomitant stuff going on in these kids' lives. Quick synopsis. When we talk about uh, intentional seeking of X-rated material, we're talking about older youth, and typically we're talking about boys. The internet is not the most common access point for X-rated material, and this seems to be the case not just with our data, but also with the Youth Internet Safety Survey data. Youth reporting exposure to X-rated material are reporting a myriad of other issues also. It's possible that X-rated material may be a marker for concern because it may be a great sort of identification, way to identify kids that actually need more intensive psychosocial follow-up. Pit stop. Yeah, um, Stephen Balcom with the Family Online Safety Institute. Um, at a round table that we held in Oxford last week, we heard um, quite different uh, story, which was from the Southwest Grid for Learning. They came across so-called nice middle-class kids living out in the country with both parents out working. They didn't have a lot going on, and therefore they, they seemed to be the ones who were uh, getting into the risky behavior which is almost the opposite of what you were just describing. In other words, they were affluent, they had computers in their bedrooms, the moms and dads both out working probably to afford all the uh, computers in the bedrooms, uh, and they were getting into and acting up in ways that you've just described quite different from the sort of profile. Do you, is, have you come across this at all? Um, well, we do, we do look at uh, rates by income and by race and socioeconomic status. We, don't, we haven't yet looked at it by geographic area. Um, and I, I don't know the methods that were used to collect these data, but I, I would still ask what else is going on in these kids' lives. Because you could be white and affluent and be bullying and be engaged in fights and going to get drunk at, you know, on the weekends and stuff. And so. Um, a lot of this sort of acting out, if there, I, I would suspect that even among those kids that you know kind of don't fit the, the typical profile that the media has built of an at-risk kid, still are ex demonstrating externalizing behaviors. 
Then it might actually just echo just because people can hear it well if it is. I think that's one of the things that really, the, to point that out, which I think is really heavy, is that often when we don't uh, demarcate what's going on in terms of their lives, we assume that class or geographic location are going to be the clean markers, when in fact that's often not the case. And often parents are not even aware of all of the other various psychosocial profile material that's going on in these kids' lives, where they're actually acting out in all sorts of different ways, and we're seeing that bubble up. Um, one of the things that I found qualitatively, which has been bothering me, and I'm trying to find some quantitative data to start looking at it, is I'm seeing um, workaholic parents basically being a really bad marker for a whole variety of these things. So when both parents are working, and they're not just working like a... We all go home now. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. That would be great. But, like, but literally, like a lack of presence of parents until like 7, 8, 9 o'clock on both sides of the parents being a huge implication. And so again, we see that normally as upper class behavior or middle upper class behavior, when in fact it's actually start, like the kids are acting out to say, hey, I want some attention. And so it's been interesting to see and qualitatively where look like in, in the United States, I'm starting to see those markers. But so it makes a very complex image when you see data like this, because it's really easy to take data like this and assume it's working class kids, when in fact often it's not. And we, we didn't present these data, but we, do, we did look at it by race and by ethnicity, and the kids who are looking at porn look exactly the same as everybody else in terms of race and, race and ethnicity. What seems to really differentiate them from other kids is kind of everything else that's going on in their lives. Yeah. We're recording right now, we might have Larry, can you please press your microphone? I'm sorry, it, it, I'm, we're hearing in the back channel, you really can hear if you're on the mic. Okay, really sorry hard. about that. Larry Maggot, yeah. Larry Maggot, connectfaithfully.org. Um, you're so far talking about looking at, at pornography, but we've also talked a lot in the last couple of meetings, and I'm sure we're going to be talking further about other risks in terms of putting yourself at risk of predation and sexual exploitation, bullying. Uh, do you have any data on that? You know, how that correlates with, with you're showing these sort of non-internet risk factors mm -hmm. in pornography. Do you have the same non-internet risk factors versus these other internet risk factors that we're, we're going to be talking about? We do. I yeah. didn't. I haven't looked at them like that. Uh, we, the close. What, what you're talking about reminds me of what we did uh, for our archives paper that was based on the Youth Internet Safety Survey data, and that was really focused on unwanted sexual solicitation right, right. and internet harassment, and really kind of looking at a what's going else on in their lives offline, but then also let's look at some of what we typically think of as risky behaviors online: sending information, posting information, talking right, to people right. online that you don't know, and and when you look at all of that. And even, I mean, so that it's a complex picture, certainly. Somebody's iPhone ringing? It's a, it's By the way, let's keep this on topic because I want okay. her to go through all of her data. So unless it's like clarifications again. Uh, okay, I'll, let me try to bring it back to, to the topic then. Uh, Mike McKeon from Verizon. So a lot of the characteristics of these risk-taking youth seem to be kind of antisocial. So do you have any sense whether these kids are using social networking sites or do they have fewer friends and therefore less likely to be on MySpace or Facebook or Zango or Bebo or, or any of those? What's your, what's your sense of that? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, we, we didn't ask whether or not, you know, where, where online did you look for pornography? So we can certainly cross it with, you know, are you using social networking sites? Is it one of your most common um, activities online? Um, you know, we're talking about one in five kids here that are intentionally seeking out pornography. We're not talking about, you know, eight, four in five kids, right, 80%, but we're talking about 20%. So we're not talking about such a small percentage that these kids are really wacky, right? I mean, we're talking about one in five. So I think, and, and we're seeing it online as well as offline, so I think it's important to kind of think about how much of this is somewhat normative in terms of, you know, kind of normal, healthy sexual development. Are some of these kids kind of seeking out extra material just as part of their sexual curiosity? And I think that's the case. And I, th but, but also then you, you're kind of you're seeing it side by side. So I think probably some of these kids are engaging in, in normative sexual curi curious behavior, both online and offline. And then I think some kids it's a marker for challenge, both online and offline. So Michelle, I think. I need once to get through this, and then we'll come back for Q and A for as you see the whole picture. Okay. So, so let's transition into violent websites and see what's going on there. Uh, these definitions are from the Youth Internet Safety Survey, and so we took them and, and used them in our survey. 
we asked about uh, four different types of, of websites. These two are from Youth Internet Safety Survey. A hate site is one that tells you to hate a group of people because of who they are, how they look, and what they believe. Okay? A death site is a website that shows pictures of dead people or people dying. Sometimes people call these snuff sites. Okay? We also asked about two different uh, new types of websites. Certainly uh, with the political situation in the United States, young people are exposed to pictures of war, death, terrorism quite a bit more than in a non-war um, era. We also, when we were doing focus groups, especially among the boys, they were talking about these websites that showed violent cartoons. They mentioned stickdeath.com, which is literally of, you know, stick people engaged in, in violent behavior, and they're chopping off arms, and there's blood, you know, everywhere. And they thought it was hilarious. And it's not a game, so we're not talking about online games. We're talking about violent cartoons online. So how often is it happening? The other thing that we noticed in focus groups, especially among the girls, when we ask them about these things, really wide eyes, right? They're like, oh, what are you talking about, okay? So we decided to ask, have you been to one? And then for those who, s we gave two options for no. No, I know what you're talking about, but I've never gone. And no, I have no idea what you're talking about, okay? First thing to notice, the yellow is yes, it's really low, right? 2% for hate sites, 4% for death sites. Not a lot of kids seeking out these websites. For news sites and for violent cartoon sites, however, we've got about one in five. The news sites make sense. Uh, you know, my homepage is a, is a news site, so <coughs> if your parents' homepage is a news site, you're actually being exposed <coughs> to this kind of stuff practically every day. So one in five. The violent cartoon sites, in terms of one in five, is a little bit concerning. Uh, there is some suggestion that when you mix violence and humor, especially with young people, it actually has a greater effect in terms of affecting behavior. Um, so one in five uh, being exposed to humorous violence. So again, let's look at trends over time and across age. We now have three waves of data. The Youth Internet Safety Survey won in 2000. And then we have two waves of data and it's not as clean, I and mean, I think part that's for two reasons. This is death and hate sites together, okay? It's not as clean, one, because the, the rates are just lower. There's just not that many kids opting into these sites no matter what age they are, so you're not going to see a whole lot of movement. But you do see somewhat of um, an upwards trend a little bit, right? Two to five percent of 10-year-olds. So when you're 10, you're not really going to these sites. When you're 16 and 17, you're not necessarily going to these sites either, but it's now around 10% of young people that are are seeking them out. What do these kids look like? Uh, well, about half male, actually. So half male, half female. Again, tend to be older. Uh, in terms of what we were talking about for the x-ray material, it's very similar here for the violent websites. In terms of race and ethnicity, at least, they look like the rest of our sample. They're just as likely to be white. They're just as likely to be Hispanic. Odds ratios, that's what that means. So the, so. All of these are non-significant except for age. So as age increases, uh, the odds of seeking out violent websites increases 20%, 1.2, 20%. How they hear about these websites? Well, for hate sites, 50% they heard from friends, death sites, 71% from friends. This is a peer-to-peer -peer sort of thing. Do you prefer to use this kind of mic? I can. Apparently it will work if it's easier for you. Oh, okay. Can you hold it? Yeah. And if those on the phone are actually not hearing after the switch, please just email the back channel or uh, let us know. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. All right, so, so friends are a huge source of information. 50% um, of hate site visitors found out from a friend and 70% of death site visitors found out from a friend. Uh, search engines, emails, links from another site. For hate sites, 17% just typed it in to see what would happen. This is beginning to look a little bit familiar, right? Wow, huh? Okay, so we look at what's going on with these kids offline. Physical bullying, kids who are looking at violent websites online are three times as likely to be bullying offline, almost four times as likely to be getting into fights, six times as likely to be carrying a weapon. We also see poor relationships with our caregiver. We see um, s serious substance use, seriously violent behavior. They're almost eight times as likely to be engaging in. These kids have a lot going on in their lives. Okay. So when we talk about violent websites, we're talking about older youth, however, no significant differences between boys and girls. 
when your prevalence rates are low. These websites are concerning, obviously, but in terms of how many kids are actually opting in, not that many. In addition to exposure to violent websites, these kids have a lot going on in their lives. So if it's built, will they come, right? I mean, kind of underlying a lot of these assumptions are, and, and we've all done it, we think about, we hear about all these horrible stories about all of these really concerning websites. So we go online and we search for them and we look at them and we think, oh my God, what if my kid looked at this thing? This is horrible. The good news is that just because it's there doesn't mean young people are gonna seek it out, okay? Remember how we had those three options, the yes, I've been to this website, no, I haven't been to this website, but I know what you're talking about, and no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, what happened was we kind of walked into an unintentional experiment. We didn't mean to, but it happened with it raises a question, well, what happens, what about those kids who didn't know about this website, and then we ask them about it, therefore telling them about it, right? <laughs> Have we unintentionally kind of caused exposure to violent websites? N no. We went back and we looked at the Wave 2 data, and very similar uh, percentages. We've got 60% of the kids who at Wave 1 said, I have no idea what you're talking about. 60% of them, again, at Wave 2 said, I have no idea what you're talking about. They don't know about it, they don't want to know about it, and they're moving on with their lives, you know? When you compare the, number, the percentage of kids among those who didn't know at Wave 1 and among those who did know at Wave 1, kind of at Wave 2, how about those that didn't know and we told them, did we create a curiosity? So do, do we see a spike in terms of those kids opting into these websites versus the other kids? No. And in, in the case of hate sites, we actually see one third, two percent of kids who didn't know about it at wave one went at wave two, seven percent who did know about it went at wave two, okay? So just because these websites exist on the internet doesn't mean that young people are seeking them out. We see that for pornography, we're seeing it in this circumstance when we tell kids about it. Um, it's good news. So I would suggest that more, just because just knowing about the website is not enough, that uh, there's probably other factors that are going on that are causing these young people to seek this out, right? We kind of think about the psychosocial profile. Again, who knows what the causality is, but it's likely, it, based upon what we're seeing, there's more going on than just knowing about the website. There's more going on than just being able to type in the address. There's a reason why some kids are going to death sites and hate sites and other kids are not. This is good news for us. It's bad news for researchers who are, you know, putting together health websites and trying to get the kids to go, and we just figured if we uploaded it, they would totally want to know about how to not drink, but they don't. But, um, <laughs> but for us, it's really good news, right? I mean, just because there are these really, really scary websites out there that we all want to protect our kids from, which is great, we don't need to assume that just because it's there, all our young people are intentionally exposing themselves to it. So quick final thoughts um, within that vein, efforts spent on kind of preventing youth from anticipated scary uh, exposures then may be missing the mark, right? Because we're kind of focused on the exposure and assuming that if everybody has the opportunity that they'll opt in. And instead, maybe we should be focusing on the young kid and using this as an opportunity to really identify young people who might be you know, experiencing significant challenge that need more intensive intervention. I also do want to point out that the numbers from the national data seem to consistently suggest across data sets that, this, that exposures to pornography, exposures to violent websites are not as high as we sometimes um, assume. And I'm going to be terrible and hold off questions because we simply have to get through the time-wise and do it, we'll try to do it together. Just give me one. I know, I'm the mean one. All right, so what I want to talk about, um, when it decides to come up, I want to talk about youth-generated content. Do you have a warning for those who are maybe watching the video uh -huh. when posted online? I, w I will get to the warning. Okay, the good. The warning will be, whoa, what happened here? Let's see here. Come back. There we go. All right, so I want to talk about youth-generated content, um, and I'll get to the warning sign in a moment. Uh, but what, I, what we want to talk about is we came into this conversation last time where we started thinking about when and where are youth generating some of this really problematic content. What we know is that youth are already engaged in certain kinds of user-generated content practices online. They're posting videos, uh, they're posting photos. This is material from uh, the Pew study. You know, it's just increasing over time. 
But you know, when and where are they posting problematic content? The first thing to keep in mind is that the vast, vast, vast majority of kids are not posting problematic content. We do not have quantitative um, material on what I'm about to cover for you, so I'm going to be doing things qualitatively. It is really easy to get scared by what it is that I'm going to cover, but let me tell you, this is not necessarily normative in any way, shape, and form. We don't have quantitative material, and I cannot find any researchers who are doing strong quantitative on this. We have some in correlation to bullying. If there's anybody in the room that wants to fund a study to look at the quantitative, I will happily connect you with researchers to do this. I think it would be great for all of us. Um, but what I'm going to cover is more of a topology of what exactly is going on that is extremely problematic, what we should be really concerned about, and what the implications are. Most likely, given other research, we're going to see um, a lining up of other problematic behavior online with what I'm seeing. I'm going to head up a oh, big, nice warning. I use pictures. I refrain from using some of the most problematic pictures, but I use pictures. Um, so some of this may not be exactly what you want to see. I'm going to start by talking about sexual content. Um, for anybody who's curious, none of these photos actually come from MySpace, which I think has shocked everybody who I've showed this slide deck to. Um, youth are producing all sorts of sexual content online. Um, this is actually relatively calm in the, in the range of potential problematic um, sexual content. You've heard the mainstream media report a dozen or so cases of uh, kids being arrested for creating child porn and distributing it to their peers and beyond. Um, that is indeed occurring in some ways. Um, we don't know what the frequency rate of it is. Um, at the same time, sexual content being produced online is increasing. I'm hearing it more and more from the kids qualitatively. Um, it tends to fall into four key categories. The first are sexy pictures. This is anything from the bathing suit picture, the things which is just strutting your stuff. Um, the vast majority of these photos are girls, although boys are participating in different ways. The second key category that I'm seeing are dance videos that may, may or may not include some form of stripping. These are usually set to a very popular um, song, whatever the media is saying is really, really popular. And they often are mimicking and emulating the images set forth by MTV, um, the, the types of video content that you see, which at this point is no longer just MTV, but that kind of video style. And some of them take the full strip style. Um, and you will see bars, of strip, like Justin strip clubs, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly, they're emulating things that they see um, often from video in some form or another. The third um, category that you see of sexual content is uh, pornographic or naked photos. Um, and these are uh, f what, you know, if, if distributed by an adult would be considered child porn if they were taken in a context that was hurting the children. There's questions of why they're being produced and whatnot. The fourth category, which all the kids call the Paris Hilton, the parent Paris Hilton videos, are otherwise sex videos. And these are full videos of almost always heterosexual sex between minors. The intended audience for all of this kind of sexual content is other youth. Um, the ex there was one exception that I found, which I find interesting and again problematic, which are kids who want attention by modeling agencies and think that they will have a better chance of getting a modeling agency if they're half naked. That says something about our modeling industry. Um, the vast majority of the kids that were talking to me about doing this kind of content are girls, and the intended audience is boys. Um, it is framed in a heterosexual context, and it comes in line with heter um, the heterosexual awakening. Um, there are young gay boys also involved, um, and that's a whole separate category of things. There are examples of lesbian imagery, but I have yet to find a case where the intended audience was actually a girl. Um, it's almost more lesbian imagery for boys. Youth po post this content for um, various reasons. One is to attract sexual attention from the peers that they desire, validation, attention, whether it's a form of flirting or attempt to, to get um, the boys to date them. Um, one is to look s to cool or sexy, to um, risky, to achieve status often amongst girls. Whereas girls are saying that by looking like these images and often these poses will act, I don't know how many of you follow Paris Hilton and Paris Hilton's escapades, but she actually has a style every season of what, how she takes a photograph. And it's a particular pose every season. One of the things you see with these girls and what their pictures they're doing is that they are literally mimicking the poses of Lindsay Lohan, Paris Hilton, et cetera, each season. And you can see the season change happening. Um, so they're trying to look cool, they're trying to achieve status within, their, within the girl's peer group, and a sexual imagery is often seen as a way to do that. A third, which is sort of one that makes me a little bit more curious and I would like to actually see some um, information, more information and quantitative work on is the, in, the goal of entertainment, boredom, or a dare. Right, producing sexy content just cause. And I'd really like to sort of get some time to work out what that's about. 
And the fourth, which gets aligned with bullying, is often to embarrass another person. So um, getting somebody to take a picture and being able to take that picture and spread it to embarrass them. Um, the sexual content is often created uh, outside of the context of mass sharing um, and then can be shared, in which it becomes a whole separate thing. So in other words, people will take a cam phone picture because they think it's fun, and then it's not expected to be shared, and of course, once a fight happens, bullying happens, off it goes into sharing La La Land. Um, one of the things that I found, which I thought was really, really interesting, is the number of teenage couples who do not see each other very often in person, heterosexual couples, but will take pornographic images and send them back and forth to one another as a form of flirting and dating. Um, again, breakups don't turn this material into being uh, kept private. Um, there are also youth who are surreptitiously capturing content, right? This is, this is the how bad can the locker room go game. There's also um, a, a whole culture within, uh, or subculture within some of these boys of status markers, i.e. I scored her, um, to uh, be a motivation for taking pictures and then sharing them um, as a way of uh, harassment. The practice of capturing all these images is not actually that new. It's interesting to hear, you see these images happen before. At the same time, the combination of, uh, and ex of accessible, easy accessible cameras, often in the form of cam phones, and the easy ways of sharing this content through, through social media mean that they spread a lot farther and can be a lot more damaging. Now, this exists, this is probably the most extreme of what we're seeing out there, or most, the most common of what we're seeing out there. It is not across all kids. Um, it's very interesting to see that um, I see a lot more Jesus uh, commentary on a daily basis when I search these sites than I do this. But often this is what gets more attention. So one of the things we do know from Michelle's work, we have some data on this in connection with bullying um, that we're seeing, you know, any form of sexual, and this may not be sexual of particular peers, um, existing in you know, a relatively uh, small numbers. But we don't have a good marker of you know, exactly getting at um, youth-generated content. Next kind of content that we have is problematic, which are those depicting illegal acts, right? Which is, this is from a college, but you're seeing it all the way across through um, high school as well. Drinking is the most common, although you're seeing some form of drugs as a depiction of act. Again, this is meant to mark status. It's meant to look cool, look ha ha ha. We had a kegger. A lot of people came. This is often, kids are actually getting much more cautious about this kind of imagery because they're getting in trouble for this kind of imagery. I.e., kids are getting kicked off of sports teams, you know, losing their scholarships, et cetera. Um, we know that teen drinking is extremely common, and the question is how much are they actually capturing it and sharing it? When and where are they using it for embarrassment? When and where are they using it um, as a way of marking status? Another big chunk is uh, aggressive videos. There are hundreds of sites dedicated purely to fight videos out there. Uh, fight videos are across all of the major sites, but then there's, you know, this is PS Fights, which is all videos. Um, it's a very popular genre of youth-generated content, and again, this is actually almost all boys, um, although there are girl fight videos as well. The interesting thing is, is that some of these are genuinely real, and some of these are actually mock videos meant for production for these sites, right? Things that are supposed to look real, you know, they actually, you know, there's discussions of how to do fake blood, the whole nine yards. At the same time, gangs are actually using this to actually prove who won at a particular brawl. Um, so you have two totally different extreme behaviors around of it. Some people just think it's funny to, you know, for boys to get together and make these videos. Some are actually capturing real videos that are really violent um, and depicting what's going on in violence within schools. Um, it's, all, it's considered to be a proof an event of an event, fun and entertainment, or to embarrass the losers is some of the reasons that that's going on. So within some of this kind of uh, content, again, we have very little data about actually what's going on in this, but we have some as it connects to um, different kinds of bullying. Um, again, this comes from uh, the research we saw before. Um, Numbers are relatively low in terms of kicked or hurt, and again, it's hard to really mark, are people you know, actually marking, for example, when they make faux videos in this particular space? Um, cell phones are where we're starting to see some of this, especially as they have more and more um, video capturing opportunities, but also pictures are already where that's happening. Um, and again, people taking video and text messages uh, of picture or video of uh, people sharing. Internet shock sites. How many of you know internet shock sites? Perry figures. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so internet. Sh I, I was I was kind and did not bring any of the pictures that really do that. 
Um, some of this is just simply gross stuff. Some of this is illegal. It's all over the place. A lot of it is meant to be disturbing, is meant to be shocking. You have sexual driven uh, content. Um, for those of you who want to see this upon recording or look this up, go have fun with goat C and two girls in one cup. I don't encourage you to look at these. These are very, very popular kinds of sexual content that is it's meant to be gross, meant to be um, disturbing. Think of it as like all sorts of bodily, hum bodily fluid humor um, and gross out humor. You also have a, um, a whole segment of the shock sites that involve car crashes, murders, accidents. Some of what we talk about is violent content. Um, interestingly, these sites are now starting to mix pictures from Iraq with pictures of other kinds of car accidents. For example, if you go through some of these sites, you will find pictures of decapitated soldiers and you will find pictures from Abu Ghraib, including those that were not shown um, in the media in our last round of it. Um, so you will see a whole variety of things that you know, we consider to be newsworthy and, th and, and some of this actually is footage of accidents that are for news, really blended in with things that are much more shocking and gross. Interestingly, from what I was seeing qualitatively, um, young boys love this stuff and they love it as a form of sharing. They use, they'll send links to one another and they have a whole variety of different potty humors around this. It's, it gets in line and it part, it's part of demarcating masculinity. Um, seeing oneself as a sort of masculine being, being able to you know, handle any of the most shocking sites on the web as seen as a marker of strength, um, being able to stomach what goes on. And you're starting to see more and more kids contribute content to this um, and try to, try to devise or imagine what they could do to be gross out um, images, what they could do to be uh, total shock content. Um, there's also a whole culture within this to take videos of people reacting to shock culture. Right? This is a whole variety of stuff for Tub Girl and Goatsy. Um, literally video upon video of showing it to friends and video capturing their emotional reactions to it. Which are never be like, oh God, why not? But that, that, that has become a performance in and of itself. Um, next sort of disturbing content. Um, this, is, this was a really fun thing to sit and go through for you guys. Uh, was all sorts of eating disorder related material. This is anorexia, bulimia. You will hear this as notions of pro ana, pro mia kinds of cultures. This is a site for thinspiration or thinspo. Thinspiration is people taking videos of, of themselves losing weight, trying to get as thin as possible and to use it as markers of proving that, you know, or, you know um, exciting other people to get thinner and thinner. Um, this is almost always mixed in with user generated content and images of celebrities. Uh, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen are particularly popular in this space right now. Um, anybody who's celebrity who looks super, super skinny who can be discussed about whether or not th you know they've been losing weight. It will often include also strategies for how to lose weight, and a lot of UGC and YGC related content comes into here. This this is one of the more interesting things because it's spread across the web. It is illegal now in France, and at the same time, what that illegalness is doing is just putting it further and further underground. For those who don't know the history of pro Anna pro Mia, part of it was that. Um, Anna, uh, pro Anna, pro anorexia. People weren't able to mention anorexia. Sites were actually scripting out that term. So people started to talk about their friend Anna and started to whole, create a whole culture of talking about their friend Anna. So all of this stuff, as it's been attempt to control within these sites, has just gone to be more invisible, but it's still extremely there. Here's where you want to close your eyes if you get really grossed out. Um, the worst of this is actually cutting and self harm. Self-harm is where you have a whole culture of kids now putting up pictures of themselves with the worst of cutting images, trying to outdo one another. And it's one of the worst of the self-harm and self-injury type spaces out there. Um, and it's really disturbing, and I will give you Happy Kitties as a more positive version of this. Um, I figure Happy Kitties are much more passion. Okay, so now I've just whipped through um, a sense of what some of that youth-generated content that is extremely problematic are. Now, as I said, with the pro Anna pro Mia, which has some of the longest of history, what we're seeing is, is that as it gets kicked off of sites, and it is continuously getting kicked off of sites, it is finding new homes throughout the web and it is existing more and more. Most of the major sites um, out there that we concern ourselves with are trying to eliminate pornography, they're trying to eliminate self-harm, they're trying to eliminate all of this content. Um, at the same time, it's, you know, it's a cat and mouse game with, with it. Um, it's certainly not desired, but it is going more and more underground. It is going more and more outside of the country um, as I've been tracking it and seeing what's happening. Um, my concern is that those kids that are doing this kind of extreme behavior desperately need help. Um, and so there's a lot of questions out there about what is the best approach for this because stopping it from, the, from some of these things is not actually working. All right, 
I am at 10 o'clock and I've whipped through this. Am I allowed to ask, uh, go for questions? I or think we have to do some questions, but okay. we're going to cut into Dana's time a little bit and then we'll figure out, but w we will start the next session at 10.45 sharp, so it's going to be uh, going to be tight. Hi, uh, Drew Weaver from AOL. A lot of the pictures you showed there uh, didn't have their faces, like the, the initial uh, sexy shots, for example. What are we finding in terms of concerns around privacy? I'm afraid I know the answer to this, but I mean, are, are the shots you're finding, are they actually showing their faces in a lot of these videos that, and pictures they're posting themselves? Well, one, I wasn't going to show stuff here, nor was I going to show child porn. I figured that would probably be over the limit of inappropriateness for me. The kids that are posting pictures that include, the, in general, in this space, are doing so f with the intended audience of their friends. Their friends assume that they know who they are, they do include photos of faces. They do include information like that. They don't expect these photos to go much further than their friends when they're producing this kind of content. Some, a lot of this content is produced literally for one or two friends. It's not meant to even go up to Facebook or MySpace. So it's really shocking when it does and you hear a lot of reactions from kids being like, what, that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, yes, there are huge privacy implications for a lot of this content, both the sexy side of things and the whole way to pornographic material, things that we definitely should be concerned about. Um, a lot of it is also just staying within the phone, um, and you will see, I mean, kids' phones have some really problematic content on them on a regular basis that we aren't even seeing on these sites. So I'm pulling up for you what is visible publicly. There's going to be more that's visible, you know, in various layers of private. with Microsoft, I mean, not, not to diminish the problematic nature of some of the content, but both with the kids accessing the pornographic sites, the violent sites, and some of the sites that you just shown, how much of it is, in, and you alluded to the fact that some of it may just be curiosity, how, is there any numbers around, are, are kids kind of accessing it for a while and then kind of saying, okay, I'm, I'm you know, over it, I've grown out of it, and then moving on to something else, or how, how much is it kind of persistent? The, the, the second question, for, for things like the, the cutting sites and, and, and others, how, how, is there any numbers around how many kids are actually kind of going to those sites? Is it, is it big? Is it small? Uh, it, it probably tracks the population of kids that do that. But I was just um, so in terms of persistence of behavior over time, we, we've started to look at the longitudinal data from 06 and 07. And I really expected strong persistence, right? I mean, if you're going to do it one year, the likelihood is that you're going to do it the next year. And that's somewhat the case. But the persistence is not, to, to make a gross generalization, it's about, a, we're, I'm seeing about a third, a third, a third. So with a, th a third, so at wave two, a third of those kids were also doing it at wave one. Um, a third of those kids did it at wave one, but didn't do it at wave two. And then a third of those kids didn't do it at wave one and did it newly at wave two. That makes sense. So, so that only about one one third of young people um, seem to be doing it over time. I'm not aware of national data in terms of um, cutting. We do have some data on self harm, which is a much broader sort of. Um, so I think at this point. So. Unrelated to my role in this, I actually am also in the process of doing um, a broader scope on uh, self-harm, anorexia, bulimia, um, uh, self-injury cutting, um, and suicide type sites. So I, if to the, anybody that's interested, as I get that out, I will happily share it with you guys. Um, I've been tracking all of the different people doing qualitative sites. To my knowledge, there are no really good in-depth quantitative sites. Again, I can happily connect funders to, to researchers who would love to study this space. Um, the qu last qualitative study that I've seen, which was um, done uh, last year, uh, but is not yet published, um, on uh, techniques for self-injury, um, anorexia and bulimia, is still finding that the kids are more likely to learn the techniques from um, being put in clinics than they are from the websites. That's where things currently stand. Um, I suspect that that may change over time. In other words, um, kids try, there's parents sending them to try to get help, um, and the kids all sit together and, and teach each other, because this is one of the most, they, they end up back in these, uh, these clinics over and over again. Um, we don't have really good numbers on these websites. Um, many of the most problematic websites are not even housed in the US. Um, I've tried to work with some of the um, sites to try to get some data. They're not willing to share anything. So we simply don't even know what numbers are like. Um, 
uh, so I think there's a lot of just confusion as to what's going on. I've talked to some psychiatrists um, that are working within um, the space of self-injury, i.e. cutting, and they're finding that um, it's sort of hit or miss as to whether the kids are using the online uh, material, online sites that they're seeing in their offices, right? These are the kids trying to come help, get help. And so it's been pretty hit or miss on that. But again, we're still patching it together. And you know, for those who don't know how I work, I try to get some of this qualitative material to quantitative researchers to start asking some of these questions. I think we're now at enough qualitative detail that it's time for some quantitative uh, studies to actually get a measure of it, but we simply don't have that yet. Oh, wait. Oh, hey. One. Jeff, oh, hey, thanks. Jeff Schmidt, quick question. Um, with respect, I think you're pointing to me, I'm sorry. Anna. That's okay. Um, have there been any research about the actual or perceived future impacts of this type of content to dating, spouses, jobs, colleges, et cetera, perceived or actual? Um, I mean, there, I think that there's been studies looking at, like, Problems of anorexia, bulimia, and other those those issues, but internet. I don't know of any that's internet specific. Do you? I think that honestly, we're missing a lot of longitudinal bit. I mean, like the stuff that's longitudinal is really just starting up. So we just don't need, and we're not tracking. Like we don't have the funds to track these kids that far. Even qualitatively, I I don't have the funds to track the kids that I interview to see how things are changing over time. So I don't really know of anything good that's that's looking at that yet. Hey, Dana, not to intervene too much, but could we maybe go two more questions and maybe three more minutes or so? So I do want to get Dana up, and we've got a tight day. Okay. I think I know how to do it now. Uh, John Dansu with Ideology. Um, first of all, from a task force standpoint, I think we need to be careful for us defining what material is inappropriate for parents. I mean, some parents, I think probably most parents, would consider uh, profanity inappropriate for their children to go look on, on the Internet for. Have... So my question relates to differing types of material. Clearly this stuff is highly inappropriate. Have we done any studies relative to 14-year-olds looking at R-rated material? I mean, we don't let our kids go see R-rated movies. I mean, can they access, do we have any studies relative to what percentage of those people are accessing material that we wouldn't let them go see in the physical world? You know, the closest we know is, the, is some of the violent, vid the, um, the rated video games. But I don't know that there's been a lot of uh, studies. I mean, most of it's looking at more of the extreme stuff. I mean, so I just I don't know what to tell you on that. In terms of definitions, it's like, yes, it's all over the place. And one of the reasons we did this presentation the way we did is we wanted to at least give you a scope of what is known in research. But I don't know of anything that's really look, looking head on at the R stuff. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to give a quick, well, I just wanted to answer that because Comscore tracks it. Well, Comscore tracks tra tracks visiting of certain kinds of sites, but it's not actually. There's, uh, we can talk more about that afterwards. Hi, Dan and Michelle. It's uh, Blair Richardson from Aristotle. Um, I had a, a question as to whether you had examined um, any data on how adult predators may have used some of these highly sexualized images or profiles on social network sites mm -hmm. to target uh, um, underage victims for sex or creation of child porn, anything like that? Um, the quick answer is we don't know a whole lot about that. The, the experts would be the folks at the University of New Hampshire, and um, they're beginning to look at it. Um, but. But uh, when you talk about kind of online sexual predators, we tend to think about, we, we, we tend to mean uh, pedophiles. Pedophiles target 10 to 12 year olds. So they're not targeting teens by definition, they're targeting children. And there tends, so that, then that gets into child pornography, which is different in, in, in some ways, many ways to what we're talking about. I was talk, I was, there was a case I sent around recently. There was the man, a uh, 33 year old man, he poses a 19 year old and I think he hooked up with 14, 15, 16 year olds. He had sex with them. He created child porn. So I don't know if that falls within the definition of pedophile, but that was kind of the uh, area I was getting into. Right. Okay. Yeah. That would actually probably fall more closely into state statutory rape. And um, 
and we talked a little bit about that last time, but just kind of in terms of you know the online and offline sort of dynamic and statutory rape, as you know, is not a new thing. And but understanding kind of how the internet plays into that is something that we're, we're looking into. <coughs> so might, uh, I'm sorry, I was going to say that might be a good segue it, into. It will be. I want to ask one question from Donna Rice Hughes, just because they, from afar, um, how are social network sites dealing with problematic groups on their sites, i.e., cutters, pro Anna drug groups? And that that may not be something for you guys to answer, know, but. I mean, I don't think that I should speak to that. I mean, I think that that's a question really for the, the sites themselves. And I think, to my knowledge, the sites have been dealing with it all different ways. A lot of people are, I mean, I was sitting there with trying to block this material, trying to stop all of it. Some of, like, for example, a lot of the pro Anna, pro Mia material, the, the images are being stopped. The images are not appearing on the social network sites in the way that they're appearing elsewhere. That said, most of the sites don't have any good way for the conversations between my friend Anna, my friend Mia, and I to really be sussed out and all of that. And that's actually where I see the most problematic content on the social network sites, is a deep discussion in very coded terms that you know I can show it to a technologist and they have no idea that that's even what it's about. Um, so I have not seen any stopping of that because they're often not aware of it. But the groups themselves, a lot, it's been, you know, they've been trying to stop a lot of it, or a huge chunk of the sites are. Different sites have been dealing with this in different problems. Um, LiveJournal, for example, wants me to actually, that's one of the reasons that I'm look, looking at some of this data, is LiveJournal is trying to figure out what to do, because each time they try to suppress it, it comes back to haunt them. And they're just trying to figure out how they can actually be more effective at it. But I don't, Great. I think the question for the major social network sites, they have that answer. Great, so I think what I'll suggest to Donna, um, who can probably hear us but not speak back, would be I'll invite the social network sites on the um, task force to respond on the list if they'd care to, um, so we can do that back channel and uh, let the let everybody know the answer to that to the extent that you want to opt in to reply. Um, but for now, uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Dana and uh, Michelle. <laughs>